The Age of Chivalry, Chapter 16, from Bullfinch, The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch, Chapter 16, Sir Palamedes. While Sir Tristram and the fair Isode abode, yet at La Jose's guard, Sir Tristram rode forth one day without armor, having no weapon but his spear and his sword. And as he rode he came to a place where he saw two knights in battle, and one of them had gotten the better and the other lay overthrown. The knight who had the better was Sir Palamedes. When Sir Palamedes knew Sir Tristram, he cried out, Sir Tristram, now we be met and ere we depart we will redress our old wrongs. As for that, said Sir Tristram, there never yet was Christian man that might make his boast that I ever fled from him, and those that art a Saracen shalt never say that of me. And therewith Sir Tristram made his horse to run, and with all his might came straight upon Sir Palamedes, and broke his spear upon him. Then he drew his sword and struck at Sir Palamedes six great strokes upon his helm. Sir Palamedes saw that Sir Tristram had not his armor on, and he marveled at his rashness and his great folly, and said to himself, If I meet and slay him, I am shamed wheresoever I go. Then Sir Tristram cried out and said, Thou coward knight, why wilt thou not do battle with me? For have thou no doubt I shall endure all thy malice. Ah, Sir Tristram, said Sir Palamedes, thou knowest I may not fight with thee for shame. For thou art here naked, and I am armed. Now I require that thou answer me a question that I shall ask you. Tell me what it is, said Sir Tristram. I put the case, said Palamedes, that you were well armed, and I naked as ye be. What would you do to me now? By your true knighthood. Ah, said Sir Tristram, now I understand thee well, Sir Palamedes. And, as God bless me, what I shall say shall not be said for fear that I have of thee. But if it were so, so shall this depart from me, for I would not have to do with thee. No more will I with thee, said Sir Palamedes, and therefore ride forth on thy way. As for that I may choose, said Sir Tristram, either to ride or to abide. But, Sir Palamedes, I marvel at one thing, that thou art so good a knight, yet that thou wilt not be christened. As for that, said Sir Palamedes, I may not yet be christened, for a vow which I made many years ago, yet in my heart I believe in our Saviour and his mild mother, Mary, but I have yet one battle to do, and when that is done, I will be christened, with a good will. By my head, said Sir Tristram, as for that one battle, thou shalt seek it no longer, for yonder is a knight whom you have smitten down. Now help me to be clothed in his armour, and I will soon fulfil thy woe. As ye will, said Sir Palamedes, so shall it be. So they rode both unto that knight that sat on a bank, and Sir Tristram saluted him, and he full weary saluted him again. Sir, said Sir Tristram, I pray you to lend me your whole armour, for I am unarmed, and I must do battle with this knight. Sir, said the hurt knight, you shall have it with a right good will. Then Sir Tristram unarmed Sir Galeron, for that was the name of the hurt knight, and he, as well as he could, helped to arm Sir Tristram. Then Sir Tristram mounted upon his own horse, and in his hand he took Sir Galeron's spear. Thereupon Sir Palamedes was ready, and so they came, hurling together, and each smote the other in the midst of their shields. Sir Palamedes' spear broke, and Sir Tristram smote down the horse. Then Sir Palamedes leapt from his horse, and drew out his sword. That saw Sir Tristram, and therewith he alighted and tied his horse to a tree. Then they came together as two wild beasts, lashing the one on the other, and so fought more than two hours. And often Sir Tristram smote such strokes at Sir Palamedes, that he made him to kneel, and Sir Palamedes broke away Sir Tristram's shield and wounded him. Then Sir Tristram was wroth out of measure, and he rushed to Sir Palamedes, and wounded him passing sore through the shoulder, and by fortune smote Sir Palamedes' sword out of his hand. 
and if Sir Palamides had stooped for his sword, Sir Tristram had slain him. Then Sir Palamides stood and beheld his sword with a full sorrowful heart. Now, said Sir Tristram, I have thee at a vantage, as thou hast me to-day, but it shall never be said in court, or among good knights, that Sir Tristram did slay any knight that was weaponless. Therefore take thou thy sword, and let us fight this battle to the end. Then spoke Sir Palamides to Sir Tristram. I have no wish to fight this battle any more. The offence that I have done unto you is not so great, but that, if it please you, we may be friends. All that I have offended is for the love of the queen, La Belle Isoude, and I dare maintain that she is peerless among ladies, and for that offence ye have given me many grievous and sad strokes, and some I have given you again. Wherefore I require you, my lord Sir Tristram, Forgive me all that I have offended you, and this day have me unto the next church, and first I will be clean confessed, and after that see you that I be truly baptized, and then we will ride together unto the court of my lord, King Arthur, so that we may be there at the feast of Pentecost. Now take your horse, said Sir Tristram, and as you have said, so shall it be done. So they took their horses, and Sir Galeron rode with them. When they came to the church of Carlisle, the bishop commanded to fill a great vessel with water, and when he had hallowed it, he then confessed Sir Palamides clean, and christened him, and Sir Tristram and Sir Galeron were his godfathers. Then soon after they departed, and rode towards Camelot, where the noble King Arthur and Queen Quenever were keeping a court royal, and the king and all the court were glad that Sir Palamides was christened. Then Sir Tristram returned again to La Joyeuse Guard, and Sir Palamides went his way. Not long after these events, Sir Gawain returned from Brittany, and related to King Arthur the adventure which befell him in the forest of Bresiliande, how Merlin had there spoken to him, and enjoined him to charge the king to go without delay upon the quest of the Holy Grail. While King Arthur deliberated Tristram, determined to enter upon the quest, and the more readily, as it was well known to him, that this holy adventure would, if achieved, procure him the pardon of all his sins. He immediately departed for the kingdom of Brittany, hoping there to obtain from Merlin counsel, to ensure success. End of chapter 16 The Age of Chivalry, Chapter Seventeen, from Bullfinch, The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch, Chapter Seventeen, Sir Tristram. On arriving in Brittany, Tristram found King Hoyle engaged in a war with a rebellious vassal and hard-pressed by his enemy. His best knights had fallen in a late battle, and he knew not where to turn for assistance. Tristram volunteered his aid, it was accepted, and the army of Hoyle, led by Tristram, and inspired by his example, gained a complete victory. The king, penetrated by the most lively sentiments of gratitude, and having informed himself of Tristram's birth, offered him his daughter in marriage. The princess was beautiful and accomplished, and bore the same name with the Queen of Cornwall. But this one is designated by the Roman seers as Isode of the White Hands, to distinguish her from the Isode the Fair. How can we describe the conflict that agitated the heart of Tristram? He adored the first Isode, but his love for her was hopeless, and not unaccompanied by remorse. Moreover, the sacred quest on which he had now entered demanded of him perfect purity of life. It seemed as if a happy destiny had provided for him, in the charming Princess Isoude of the White Hands, the best security for all his good resolutions. This last reflection determined him. They were married and passed some months in tranquil happiness at the court of King Hoel. The pleasure which Tristram felt in his wife's society increased day by day. 
An inward grace seemed to stir within him from the moment when he took the oath to go on the quest of the Holy Grail. It seemed even to triumph over the power of the magic love potion. The war, which had been quelled for a time, now burst out anew. Tristram, as usual, was foremost in every danger. The enemy was worsted in successive conflicts, and at last shut himself up in his principal city. Tristram led on the attack of the city. As he mounted a ladder to scale the walls, he was struck on the head by a fragment of rock, which the besieged threw down upon him. It bore him to the ground, where he lay insensible. As soon as he recovered consciousness, he demanded to be carried to his wife. The princess, skilled in the art of surgery, would not suffer any one but herself to touch her beloved husband. Her fair hands bound up his wounds. Tristram kissed them with gratitude, which began to grow into love. At first the devoted cares of Isoda seemed to meet with great success, but after a while these flattering appearances vanished, and in spite of all her care, the malady grew more serious day by day. In this perplexity an old squire of Tristram's reminded his master that the princess of Ireland, afterwards queen of Cornwall, had once cured him under circumstances quite as discouraging. He called Isode of the White Hands to him, told her of his former cure, added that he believed the Queen Isode could heal him, and that he felt sure that she would come to his relief if sent for. Isode of the White Hands consented that Jesnes, a trusty man and skilful navigator, should be sent to Cornwall. Tristram called him and giving him a ring. Take this, he said, to the Queen of Cornwall. Tell her that Tristram, near to death, demands her aid. If you succeed in bringing her with you, place white sails to your vessel on your return, that we may know of your success when the vessel first heaves in sight. But if Queen Isoda refuses, put on black sails. There will be the presage of my impending death. Jesnes performed his mission successfully. King Mark happened to be absent from his capital, and the queen readily consented to return with the bark to Brittany. Jesnes closed his vessel in the whitest of sails, and sped his way back to Brittany. Meantime the wound of Tristram grew more desperate day by day. His strength, quite prostrated, no longer permitted him to be carried to the seaside daily, as had been his custom from the first moment when it was possible for the bark to be on the way homeward. He called a young damsel, and gave her in charge to keep watch in the direction of Cornwall, and to come and tell him the color of the sails of the first vessel she should see approaching. When Isoda of the White Hands consented that the Queen of Cornwall should be sent for, she had not known all the reasons which she had for fearing the influence which renewed intercourse with that princess might have on her own happiness. She had now learned more, and felt the danger more keenly. She thought, if she could only keep the knowledge of the queen's arrival from her husband, she might employ in his service any resources which her skill could supply, and still avert the dangers which she apprehended. When the vessel was seen approaching, with its white sails sparkling in the sun, the damsel, by command of her mistress, carried word to Tristram that the sails were black. Tristram, penetrated with inexpressible grief, breathed a profound sigh, turned away his face, and said, Alas, my beloved, we shall never see one another again. Then he commanded himself to God, and breathed his last. The death of Tristram was the first intelligence which the Queen of Cornwall heard on landing. She was conducted almost senseless into the chamber of Tristram, and expired holding him in her arms. Tristram, before his death, had requested that his body should be sent to Cornwall, and that his sword, with the letter he had written, should be delivered to King Mark. The remains of Tristram and Isoda were embarked in a vessel, along with the sword, which was presented to the King of Cornwall. He was melted with tenderness when he saw the weapon which slew Morant of Ireland, which had so often saved his life, and redeemed the honor of his kingdom. In the letter Tristram begged pardon of his uncle, and related the story of the amorous draught. Mark ordered the lovers to be buried in his own chapel. From the tomb of Tristram there sprung a vine, which went along the walls, 
and descended into the grave of the queen. It was cut down three times, but each time sprung up again more vigorous than before, and this wonderful plant has ever since shaded the tombs of Tristram and Isode. Spencer introduces Sir Tristram in his fairy queen. In Book Six, Canto Two, Sir Calidor encounters in the forest a young hunter, whom he thus describes. Him steadfastly he marked, and saw to be, a goodly youth of amiable grace, yet by a slender slip that scarce did see, yet seventeen years, but tall and fair of face, that sure he deemed him born of noble race. All in woodman's jacket he was clad, of Lincoln green, belayed with silver lace, and on his head an hood with aglets spread, and by his side his hunter's horn he hanging had. Buskins he wore of costliest cordervain, picked up in gold and paled part per part, as then the guise was for each gentle swain. In his right hand he held a trembling dart, whose fellow he before had sent apart, and in his left he held a sharp poor spear, with which he wont to launch the salvage heart, of many a lion and of many a bear, that first unto his hand in chase did happen near. End of chapter 17 Of Chivalry. Chapter 18 from Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anders Lankford. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 18 Percival. The father and two elder brothers of Percival had fallen in battle or tournaments, and hence, as the last hope of his family, his mother retired with him into a solitary region, where he was brought up in total ignorance of arms and chivalry. He was allowed no weapon, but a little Scots spare, which was the only thing of all her lord's fair gear that his mother carried to the wood with her. In the use of this, he became so skillful that he could kill with it, not only the animals of the chase for the table, but even birds on the wing. At length, however, Percival was roused to a desire of military renown by seeing in the forest five knights who were in complete armor. He said to his mother, Mother, what are those yonder? They are angels, my son, said she. By my faith I will go and become an angel with them. And Percival went to the road, and met them. "'Tell me, good lad,' said one of them, "'sawest thou a knight pass this way either to-day or yesterday?' "'I know not,' said he, "'what a knight is.' "'Such an one as I am,' said the knight. "'If thou wilt tell me what I ask thee, "'I will tell thee what thou askest me.' "'Gladly will I do so,' said Sir Owain, "'for that was the knight's name. "'What is this?' demanded Percival, touching the saddle. "'It is a saddle,' said Owain. Then he asked about all the accoutrements which he saw upon the men, and the horses, and about the arms, and what they were for, and how they were used. And Sir Owain showed him all those things fully. And Percival, in return, gave him such information as he had. Then Percival returned to his mother, and said to her, "'Mother, those were not angels, but honorable knights.' Then his mother swooned away, and Percival went to the place where they kept the horses that carried firewood and provisions for the castle. And he took a bony piebald horse, which seemed to him the strongest of them, and he pressed a pack into the form of a saddle, and with twisted twigs he imitated the trappings which he had seen upon the horses. When he came again to his mother, the countess had recovered from her swoon. "'My son,' said she, "'desirest thou to ride forth?' Yes, with thy leave, said he. Go forward, then, she said, to the court of Arthur, where there are the best and the noblest and the most bountiful of men, and tell him thou art Percival, the son of Pellinore, and ask of him to bestow knighthood on thee, and whenever thou seest a church, repeat there thy paternoster. And if thou see meat and drink, and thou hast need of them, 
thou mayest take them. If thou hear an outcry of one in distress, proceed toward it, especially if it be the cry of a woman, and render her what service thou canst. If thou see a fair jewel, win it. For thus shalt thou acquire fame, yet freely give it to another, for thus thou shalt obtain praise. If thou see a fair woman, pay court to her, for thus thou wilt obtain love. After this discourse, Percival mounted the horse, and taking a number of sharp-pointed sticks in his hand, he rode forth. And he rode far in the woody wilderness, without food or drink. At last he came to an opening in the wood, where he saw a tent, and as he thought it might be a church, he said his paternoster to it. And he went towards it, and the door of the tent was open. And Percival dismounted and entered the tent. In the tent he found a maiden sitting, with a golden frontlet on her forehead, and a gold ring on her hand. And Percival said, Maiden, I salute you, for my mother told me whenever I met a lady I must respectfully salute her. Perceiving in one corner of the tent some food, two flasks full of wine and some boar's flesh roasted, he said, My mother told me whenever I saw meat and drink to take it, and he ate greedily for he was very hungry. The maiden said, Sir, thou hadst best go quickly from here, for fear that my friends should come and evil should befall you. But Percival said, My mother told me whenever I saw a fair jewel to take it, and he took the gold ring from her finger and put it on his own, and he gave the maiden his own ring in exchange for hers. Then he mounted his horse and rode away. Percival journeyed on till he arrived at Arthur's court, and it so happened that just at that time an uncourteous knight had offered Queen Guinevere a gross insult. For when her page was serving the queen with a golden goblet, this knight struck the arm of the page and dashed the wine in the queen's face and over her stomacher. Then he said, If any have boldness to avenge this insult to Guinevere, let him follow me to the meadow. So the knight took his horse and rode to the meadow, carrying away the golden goblet, and all the household hung down their heads, and no one offered to follow the knight to take vengeance upon him, for it seemed to them that no one would have ventured on so daring an outrage unless he possessed such powers through magic or charms that none could be able to punish him. Just then, behold, Percival entered the hall upon the bony piebald horse, with his uncouth trappings. In the center of the hall stood Kay the seneschal. "'Tell me, tall man,' said Percival, "'is that Arthur yonder?' "'What wouldst thou with Arthur?' asked Kay. "'My mother told me to go to Arthur, and receive knighthood from him.' "'By my faith,' said he, "'thou art all too meanly equipped with horse and with arms.' Then all the household began to jeer and laugh at him. But there was a certain damsel who had been a whole year at Arthur's court, and had never been known to smile. And the king's fool, footnote, a fool was a common appendage of the courts of those days when this romance was written. A fool was the ornament held in next estimation to a dwarf. He wore a white dress with a yellow bonnet, and carried a bell or bauble in his hand. Though called a fool, his words were often weighed and remembered as if there were a sort of oracular meaning in them. The king's fool had said that this damsel would not smile till she had seen him who would be the flower of chivalry. Now this damsel came up to Percival and told him, smiling, that if he lived he would be one of the bravest and best of knights. Truly, said Kay, thou art ill taught to remain a year at Arthur's court with choice of society, and smile on no one, and now before the face of Arthur and all his knights, to call such a man as this the flower of knighthood. And he gave her a box on the ear, that she fell senseless to the ground. Then said Kay to Percival, Go after the knight who went hence to the meadow, overthrow him, and recover the golden goblet, and possess thyself of his horse and arms, and thou shalt have knighthood. I will do so, tall man, said Percival. So he turned his horse's head toward the meadow, and when he came there, the knight was riding up and down, proud of his strength and valor and noble mien. "'Tell me,' said the knight, "'didst thou see any one coming after me from the court?' 
The tall man that was there, said Percival, told me to come and overthrow thee, and to take from thee the goblet, and thy horse and armor for myself. Silence, said the knight. Go back to the court, and tell Arthur either to come himself, or to send some other knight to fight with me, and unless he do so quickly I will not wait for him. By my faith, said Percival, choose thou whether it shall be willingly or unwillingly, for I will have the horse, and the arms, and the goblet. Upon this the knight ran at him furiously, and struck him a violent blow with the shaft of his spear, between the neck and the shoulder. Ha, <laughs> ha, lad, said Percival, my mother's servants were not used to play with me in this wise, so thus will I play with thee. And he threw at him one of his sharp-pointed sticks, and it struck him in the eye, and came out at the back of his head, so that he fell down lifeless. Verily, said Sir Owain, the son of Urien, to Kay the Seneschal, thou wast ill-advised to send that madman after the knight, for he must either be overthrown or flee, and either way it will be a disgrace to Arthur and his warriors. Therefore will I go to see what has befallen him. So Sir Owain went to the meadow, and he found Percival trying in vain to get the dead knight's armor off, in order to clothe himself with it. Sir Owain unfastened the armor and helped Percival to put it on, and taught him how to put his foot in the stirrup and use the spur, for Percival had never used stirrup nor spur, but rode without saddle, and urged on his horse with a stick. Then Owain would have had him return to the court to receive the praise that was his due. But Percival said, I will not come to the court till I have encountered the tall man that is there, to revenge the injury he did to the maiden. But take thou the goblet to Queen Guinevere, and tell King Arthur that wherever I am I will be his vassal, and will do him what profit and service I can. And Sir Owain went back to the court, and related all these things to Arthur and Guinevere, and to all the household. And Percival rode forward, and he came to a lake on the side of which was a fair castle, and on the border of the lake he saw a hoary-headed man sitting upon a velvet cushion, and his attendants were fishing in the lake. When the hoary-headed man beheld Percival approaching, he arose and went into the castle. Percival rode to the castle, and the door was open, and he entered the hall. And the hoary-headed man received Percival courteously, and asked him to sit by him on the cushion. When it was time, the tables were set, and they went to meet. And when they had finished their meat, the hoary-headed man asked Percival if he knew how to fight with the sword. I know not, said Percival, but were I to be taught, doubtless I should. And the hoary-headed man said to him, I am thy uncle, thy mother's brother. I am called King Petcher. Footnote. The word means both fisher and sinner. Thou shalt remain with me a space, in order to learn the manners and customs of different countries, and courtesy and noble bearing. And this do thou remember, if thou seest aught to cause thy wonder, ask not the meaning of it. If no one has the courtesy to inform thee, the reproach will not fall upon thee, but upon me, that am thy teacher." While Percival and his uncle discoursed together, Percival beheld two youths enter the hall, bearing a golden cup and a spear of mighty size, with blood dripping from its point to the ground. And when all the company saw this, they began to weep and lament. But for all that, the man did not break off his discourse with Percival. And as he did not tell him the meaning of what he saw, he forbore to ask him concerning it. Now the cup that Percival saw was the Sangreal and the spear, the sacred spear, and afterwards King Petcher removed with those sacred relics into a far country. One evening Percival entered a valley, and came to a hermit's cell, and the hermit welcomed him gladly, and there he spent the night. And in the morning he arose, and when he went forth, behold, a shower of snow had fallen in the night, and a hawk had killed a wild fowl in front of the cell, and the noise of the horse had scared the hawk away, and a raven alighted on the bird. And Percival stood and compared the blackness of the raven, and the whiteness of the snow, and the redness of the blood, to the hair of the lady that best he loved, which was blacker than jet, and to her skin, which was whiter than the snow, and to the two red spots upon her cheeks, which were redder than the blood upon the snow. 
Now Arthur and his household were in search of Percival, and by chance they came that way. Know ye, said Arthur, who is the knight with the long spear that stands by the brook up yonder? Lord, said one of them, I will go and learn who he is. So the youth came to the place where Percival was, and asked him what he did thus, and who he was. But Percival was so intent upon his thought that he gave him no answer. Then the youth thrust at Percival with his lance, and Percival turned upon him and struck him to the ground. And when the youth returned to the king and told how rudely he had been treated, Sir Kay said, I will go myself. And when he greeted Percival and got no answer, he spoke to him rudely and angrily. And Percival thrust at him with his lance, and cast him down so that he broke his arm and his shoulder-blade. And while he lay thus stunned, his horse returned back at a wild and prancing pace. Then said Sir Gawain, surnamed the Golden-Tongued because he was the most courteous knight in Arthur's court, It is not fitting that any should disturb an honorable knight from his thought unadvisedly, for either he is pondering some damage that he has sustained, or he is thinking of the lady whom best he loves. If it seem well to thee, lord, I will go and see if this knight has changed from his thought, and if he has, I will ask him courteously to come and visit thee. And Percival was resting on the shaft of his spear, pondering the same thought. And Sir Gawain came to him and said, If I thought it would be as agreeable to thee as it would be to me, I would converse with thee. I have also a message from Arthur unto thee, to pray thee to come and visit him, and two men have been before on this errand. That is true, said Percival, and uncourteously they came. They attacked me, and I was annoyed thereat. Then he told him the thought that occupied his mind, and Gawain said, This was not an ungentle thought, and I should marvel if it were pleasant for thee to be drawn from it. Then said Percival, Tell me, is Sir Kay in Arthur's court? He is, said Gawain, and truly he is the knight who fought with thee last. Verily, said Percival, I am not sorry to have thus avenged the insult to the smiling maiden. Then Percival told him his name, and said, Who art thou? And he replied, I am Gawain. I am right glad to meet thee, said Percival, for I have everywhere heard of thy prowess and uprightness, and I solicit thy fellowship. Thou shalt have it by my faith, and grant me thine, said he. Gladly will I do so, answered Percival. So they went together to Arthur, and saluted him. Behold, Lord, said Gawain, him whom thou hast sought so long. Welcome unto thee, chieftain, said Arthur. And hereupon there came the queen and her handmaidens, and Percival saluted them, and they were rejoiced to see him, and bade him welcome. And Arthur did him great honor and respect, and they returned towards Caerleon. End of chapter 18 Recording by Anders Lankford Bullfinches, The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 19. The Sangreal, or Holy Grail. The Sangreal was the cup from which our Saviour drank at his last supper. He was supposed to have given it to Joseph of Arimathea, who carried it to Europe, together with the spear with which the soldier pierced the Saviour's side. From generation to generation, one of the descendants of Joseph of Arimathea had been devoted to the guardianship of these precious relics, but on the sole condition of leading a life of purity in thought, word, and deed. For a long time the Sangreal was visible to all pilgrims, and its presence conferred blessings upon the land in which it was preserved. But at length one of those holy men to whom its guardianship had descended so far forgot the obligation of his sacred office as to look with unhallowed eye upon a young female pilgrim whose robe was accidentally loosened as she knelt before him. The sacred lance instantly punished his frailty, spontaneously falling upon him and inflicting a deep wound. The marvellous wound could by no means be healed, 
and the guardian of the Sangriol was ever after called Le Roy Pesture, the Sinner King. The Sangriol withdrew its visible presence from the crowds who came to worship, and an iron age succeeded to the happiness which its presence had diffused among the tribes of Britain. But then the times grew to such evil that the holy cup was caught away to heaven and disappeared, the Holy Grail. We have told in the history of Merlin how that great prophet and enchanter sent a message to King Arthur by Sir Gawain, directing him to undertake the recovery of the Sangreal, informing him, at the same time, that the knight who should accomplish that sacred quest was already born, and of a suitable age to enter upon it. Sir Gawain delivered his message, and the king was anxiously revolving in his mind how best to achieve the enterprise, when, at the vigil of Pentecost, all the fellowship of the round table being met together at Camelot, as they sat at meat, suddenly there was heard a clap of thunder, and then a bright light burst forth, and every knight, as he looked on his fellow, saw him in seeming fairer than ever before. All the hall was filled with sweet odours, and every knight had such meat and drink as he best loved. Then there entered into the hall the Holy Grail, covered with white samite, so that none could see it, and it passed through the hall suddenly and disappeared. During this time no one spoke a word, but when they had recovered breath to speak, King Arthur said, Certainly we ought to greatly thank our Lord for what he hath showed us this day. Then Sir Gawain rose up, and made a vow that for twelve months and a day he would seek the Sangreal, and not return till he had seen it, if so he might speed. When they of the round table heard Sir Gawain say so, they arose, the most part of them, and vowed the same. When King Arthur heard this he was greatly displeased, for he knew very well that they might not gainsay their vows. Alas, said he to Sir Gawain, you have nigh slain me with the vow and promise that ye have made, for ye have bereft me of the fairest fellowship that ever were seen together in any realm of the world. For when they shall depart hence, I am sure that all shall never meet more in this world. Sir Galahad At that time there entered the hall a good old man, and with him he brought a young knight, and these words he said, Peace be with you, fair lords. Then the old man said unto King Arthur, Sir, I bring you here a young knight that is of king's lineage, and of kindred of Joseph of Arimathea, being the son of Dame Elaine, the daughter of King Pelles, king of the foreign country. Now the name of the young knight was Sir Galahad, and he was the son of Sir Lancelot du Lac, but he had dwelt with his mother at the court of King Pelles, his grandfather, till now he was old enough to bear arms and his mother had sent him in the charge of a holy hermit to King Arthur's court. Then Sir Launcelot beheld his son, and had great joy of him. And Sir Bohort told his fellows, Upon my life, this young knight shall come to great worship. The noise was great in all the court, so that it came to the queen. And she said, I would fain see him, for he must needs be a noble knight, for so is his father. And the queen and her ladies all said that he resembled much unto his father, and he was seemly and demure as a dove, with all manner of good features, that in the whole world men might not find his match. And King Arthur said, God make him a good man, for beauty faileth him not, as any that liveth. Then the hermit led the young knight to the siege perilous, and he lifted up the cloth, and found there letters that said, This is the seat of Sir Galahad, the good knight, and he made him sit in that seat. And all the knights of the round table marvelled greatly at Sir Galahad, seeing him sit securely in that seat, and said, This is he by whom the Sangreal shall be achieved, for there never sat one before in that seat without being mischieved. On the next day the king said, Now, at this quest of the Sangreal, shall all of ye of the round table depart, and never shall I see you again together. Therefore I will that ye all repair to the meadow of Camelot, for to dust and tourney yet once more before ye depart." but all the meaning of the king was to see Sir Galahad proved. So then were they all assembled in the meadow. Then Sir Galahad, by request of the king and queen, put on his harness and his helm, but shield would he take none for any prayer of the king. And the queen was in a tower, with all her ladies, to behold the tournament. Then Sir Galahad rode into the midst of the meadow, and there he began to break spears marvellously, so that all men had wonder of him, for he surmounted all knights that encountered with him except two, Sir Launcelot and Sir Percival. So many knights that all the people cried, and almost burst the barriers in their heat, shouting, Sir Galahad and Sir Percival. Sir Galahad. Then the king, at the queen's request, made him to alight, and presented him to the queen, and she said, 
never two men resembled one another more than he and Sir Launcelot, and therefore it is no marvel that he is like him in prowess. Then the king and queen went to the minster, and the knights followed them. And after the service was done they put on their helms and departed, and there was great sorrow. They rode through the streets of Camelot, and there was weeping of the rich and poor, and the king turned away, and might not speak for weeping. And so they departed, and every knight took the way that him best liked. Sir Galahad rode forth without shield, and rode four days, and found no adventure. And on the fourth day he came to a white abbey, and there he was received with great reverence, and led to a chamber. He met there two knights, King Bagdemagogus, and Sir Uwin, and they made of him great solace. Sirs, said Sir Galahad, what adventure brought you hither? Sir, said they, it is told us that within this place is a shield, which no man may bear unless he be worthy, and if one unworthy should attempt to bear it, it shall surely do him a mischief. Then King Bagdemagus said, I fear not to bear it, and that ye shall see to-morrow. So on the morrow they arose, and heard mass. Then King Bagdemagus asked where the adventurous shield was. Anon a monk led him behind an altar, where the shield hung, as white as snow, but in the midst there was a red cross. Then King Bagdemagus took the shield, and bare it out of the minster, and he said to Sir Galahad, If it please you, abide here till you know how I shall speed. Then King Bagdemagus and his squire rode forth, and when they had ridden a mile or two, they saw a goodly knight come towards them, in white armour, horse and all, and he came as fast as his horse might run, with his spear in the rest, and King Bagdemagus directed his spear against him, and broke it upon the white knight, but the other struck him so hard that he broke the mails, and thrust him through the right shoulder, for the shield covered him not, and so he bare him from his horse. Then the white knight turned his horse and rode away. Then the squire went to King Bagdemagus, and asked him whether he were sore wounded or not. I am sore wounded, said he, and full hardly shall I escape death. Then the squire set him on his horse, and brought him to an abbey, and there he was taken down softly and unarmed, and laid in a bed, and his wound was looked to, for he lay there long, and hardly escaped with his life. And the squire brought the shield back to the abbey. The next day Sir Galahad took the shield, and within a while came to the hermitage, where he met the white knight, and each saluted the other courteously. Sir, said Sir Galahad, can you tell me the marvel of the shield? Sir, said the white knight, that shield belonged of old to the gentle knight, Joseph of Arimathea, and when he came to die, he said, Never shall man bear this shield about his neck, but he shall repent it, unto the time that Sir Galahad the good knight bear it, the last of my lineage, the which shall do many marvellous deeds. And then the white knight vanished away. Sir Gawain After Sir Gawain departed, he rode many days, both toward and forward, and at last he came to the abbey where Sir Galahad took the white shield. And they told Sir Gawain of the marvellous adventure that Sir Galahad had done. Truly, said Sir Gawain, I am not happy that I took not the way that he went, for if I may meet with him, I will not part from him lightly, that I may partake with him all the marvellous adventures, which he shall achieve. Sir, said one of the monks, he will not be of your fellowship. Why, said Sir Gawain, sir, said he, because ye be sinful, and he is blissful. Then said the monk, Sir Gawain, thou must do penance for thy sins. Sir, what penance shall I do? Such as I will show, said the good man. Nay, said Sir Gawain, I will do no penance, for we knights adventurous often suffer great woe and pain. Well, said the good man, and he held his peace, and Sir Gawain departed. Now it happened, not long after this, that Sir Gawain and Sir Hector rode together, and they came to a castle where there was a great tournament. And Sir Gawain and Sir Hector joined themselves to the party that seemed the weaker, and they drove before them the other party. Then suddenly came into the lists a knight, bearing a white shield with a red cross, and by adventure he came by Sir Gawain, and he smote him so hard that he clave his helm and wounded his head, so that Sir Gawain fell to the earth. When Sir Hector saw that, he knew that the knight with the white shield was Sir Galahad, and he thought it no wisdom to abide him, and also for natural love, that he was his uncle. Then Sir Galahad retired privily, so that none knew where he had gone. And Sir Hector raised up Sir Gawain, and said, Sir, me seemeth your quest is done. It is done, said Sir Gawain, I shall seek no further. Then Gawain was borne into the castle, and unarmed, and laid in a rich bed, and a leech found to search his wound. 
and Sir Gawain and Sir Hector abode together, for Sir Hector would not away till Sir Gawain were whole. End of chapter 19《of Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 20. The Songrail. Continued. Sir Lancelot. Sir Lancelot rode overthwart and endlong in a wide forest, and held no path but as wild adventure lee him. My golden spurs now bring to me, and bring me to my richest mail, for to-morrow I go over land and sea in search of the holy, holy grail. Shall never a bed for me be spread, nor shall a pillow be under my head, till I begin my vow to keep, here on the rushes will I sleep, and perchance there may come a vision true, ere day create the world anew. Lowell's Holy Grail And at last he came to a stone cross. Then Sir Lancelot looked round him and saw an old chapel. So he tied his horse to a tree, and put off his shield, and hung it upon a tree, and then he went into the chapel, and looked through a place where the wall was broken. And within he saw a fair altar, full, richly arrayed with cloth of silk, and there stood a fair candlestick, which bare six great candles, and the candlestick was of silver. When Sir Lancelot saw this light, he had a great wish to enter the chapel, but he could find no place where he might enter. Then was he passing heavy and dismayed. And he returned, and came again to his horse, and took off his saddle and his bridle, and let him pasture, and unlaced his helm, and ungirded his sword, and laid him down to sleep upon his shield before the cross. And as he lay, half waking and half sleeping, he saw come by him two palfreys, both fair and white, which bare a litter, on which lay a sick knight. And when he was nigh the cross, he there abode still. And Sir Lancelot heard him say, O oh, sweet Lord, when shall this sorrow leave me, and when shall the holy vessel come by me, whereby I shall be healed? And thus a great while complained the knight, and Sir Lancelot heard it. Then Sir Lancelot saw the candlestick, with the lighted tapers, come before the cross, but he could see nobody that brought it. Also there came a salver of silver and the holy vessel of the Sangreal, and therewithal the sick knight sat him upright, and held up both his hands, and said, Fair sweet Lord, which is here within the holy vessel, take heed to me, that I may be whole of this great malady. And therewith upon his hands and upon his knees he went so nigh that he touched the holy vessel and kissed it, and anon he was whole. Then the holy vessel went into the chapel again, with the candlestick and the light, so that Sir Lancelot wist not what became of it. Then the sick knight rose up and kissed the cross, and anon his squire brought him his arms, and asked his lord how he did. "'I thank God right heartily,' said he, "'for through the holy vessel I am healed. But I have great marvel of this sleeping knight, who hath neither grace nor power to awake during the time that the holy vessel hath been here present. I dare it right well say,' said the squire, "'that this same knight is stained with some manner of deadly sin, whereof he was never confessed.' So they departed." Then anon Sir Lancelot waked, and set himself upright, and bethought him of what he had seen, and whether it were dreams or not. And he was passing heavy, and wist not what to do. And he said, My sin and my wretchedness hath brought me into great dishonour, for when I sought worldly adventures and worldly desires, I ever achieved them, and had the better in every place, and never was I discomfited in any quarrel, were it right or wrong. And now I take upon me the adventure of holy things, I see and understand that mine old sin hindereth me, so that I had no power to stir, nor to speak, when the holy blood appeared before me. So thus he sorrowed till it was day, and heard the fowls of the air sing. Then he was somewhat comforted. Then he departed from the cross into the forest, and there he found a hermitage, and a hermit therein, who was going to Mass. So when Mass was done Sir Lancelot called the hermit to him, and prayed him for charity to hear his confession. "'With a good will,' said the good man. And then he told that good man all his life, and how he had loved a queen unmeasurably many years. And all my great deeds of arms that I have done, I did the most part for the queen's sake, and for her sake would I do battle, were it right or wrong. And never did I battle all, only for God's sake, but for to win worship, 
and to cause me to be better beloved, and little or not I thanked God for it. I pray you counsel me. I will counsel you, said the hermit, if ye will ensure me that ye will never come in that queen's fellowship as much as ye may forbear. And then Sir Launcelot promised the hermit, by his faith, that he would no more come into her company. Look that your heart and your mouth accord, said the good man, and I shall ensure you that ye shall have more worship than ever ye had. Then the good man enjoined Sir Launcelot such penance as he might do, and he assailed Sir Launcelot, and made him abide with him all that day. And Sir Launcelot repented him greatly. Sir Percival Sir Percival departed and rode till the hour of noon, and he met in a valley about twenty men of arms. And when they saw Sir Percival, they asked him whence he was, and he answered, Of the court of King Arthur. Then they all cried at once, Slay him! But Sir Percival smote the first to the earth, and his horse upon him. Then seven of the knights smote upon his shield all at once, and the remnant slew his horse, so that he fell to the earth. So had they slain him or taken him, had not the good knight Sir Galahad, with the red cross, come there by adventure. And when he saw all the knights upon one, he cried out, Save me that knight's life! Then he rode toward the twenty men of arms, as fast as his horse might drive, with his spear in the rest, and smote the foremost horse and man to the earth. And when his spear was broken, he set his hand to his sword, and smote on the right hand and the left, that it was marvel to see, and at every stroke he smote down one, or put him to rebuke, so that they would fight no more, but fled to a thick forest, and Sir Galahad followed them. And when Sir Percival saw him chase them so, he made great sorrow that his horse was slain, and he wist well it was Sir Galahad. Then he cried aloud, Ah, fair knight, abide, and suffer me to do thanks unto thee, for right well ye have done for me. But Sir Galahad rode so fast that at last he passed out of his sight. When Sir Percival saw that he would not turn, he said, Now am I a very wretch, and most unhappy above all other knights. So in his sorrow he abode all that day till it was night, and then he was faint, and laid him down and slept till midnight. And then he awaked, and saw before him a woman who said unto him, Sir Percival, what dost thou hear? He answered, I do neither good nor great ill. If thou wilt promise me, she said, that thou wilt fulfil my will when I summon thee, I will lend thee my own horse, which shall bear thee whither thou wilt. Sir Percival was glad of her proffer, and ensured her to fulfil all her desire. Then abide me here, and I will go fetch you a horse. And so she soon came back again, and brought a horse with her that was inky black. When Percival beheld that horse he marvelled, it was so great and so well apparelled. And he leapt upon him, and took no heed of himself. And he thrust him with his spurs, and within an hour and less he bare him four days' journey thence, until he came to a rough water, which roared, and his horse would have borne him into it. And when Sir Percival came nigh the brim, and saw the water so boisterous, he doubted to overpass it. And then he made the sign of the cross on his forehead. When the fiend felt him so charged, he shook off Sir Percival, and went into the water, crying and roaring, and it seemed unto him that the water burned. Then Sir Percival perceived it was a fiend that would have brought him into his perdition. Then he commended himself unto God, and prayed our Lord to keep him from all such temptations, and so he prayed all that night till it was day. Then he saw that he was in a wild place, that was closed with all the sea nigh about and Sir Percival looked forth over the sea, and saw a ship come sailing towards him, and it came and stood under the rock. And when Sir Percival saw this, he hied him thither, and found the ship covered with silk, and therein was a lady of great beauty, and clothed so richly that none might be better. And when she saw Sir Percival, she saluted him, and Sir Percival returned her salutation. Then he asked her of her country and her lineage. And she said, I am a gentlewoman that am disinherited, and was once the richest woman of the world. Damsel, said Sir Percival, who hath disinherited you? For I have great pity of you. Sir, said she, my enemy is a great and powerful lord, and aforetime he made much of me, so that of his favour and of my beauty I had a little pride more than I ought to have had. Also I said a word that pleased him not. So he drove me from his company and from mine heritage. Therefore I know no good knight nor good man, but I get him on my side if I may. And for that I know that thou art a good knight, I beseech thee to help me. Then Sir Percival promised her all the help that he might, and she thanked him. And at that time the weather was hot, and she called to her a gentlewoman, and bade her bring forth a pavilion. 
and she did so, and pitched it upon the gravel. Sir, said she, now may you rest you in this heat of the day. Then he thanked her, and she put off his helm and his shield, and there he slept a great while. Then he awoke, and asked her if she had any meat, and she said, Yea, and so there was set upon the table all manner of meats that he could think on. Also he drank there the strongest wine that ever he drank, and therewith he was a little chafed more than he ought to be. With that he beheld the lady, and he thought she was the fairest creature that he ever saw. And then Sir Percival proffered her love, and prayed her that she would be his. Then she refused him in a manner, for the cause he should be the more ardent on her, and ever he ceased not to pray her of love. And when she saw him well and chafed, then she said, Sir Percival, wit you well, I shall not give you my love, unless you swear from henceforth you will be my true servant, and do no thing but that I shall command you. Will you ensure me this, as you be a true knight? Yea, said he, fair lady, by the faith of my body. And as he said this, by adventure and grace, he saw his sword lie on the ground naked, in whose pommel was a red cross, and the sign of the crucifix thereon. Then he made the sign of the cross on his forehead, and therewith the pavilion shrivelled up, and changed into a smoke and a black cloud. And the damsel cried aloud, and hastened into the ship, and so she went with the wind roaring and yelling that it seemed all the water burned after her. Then Sir Percival made great sorrow, and called himself a wretch, saying, How nigh was I lost! Then he took his arms, and departed thence. End of chapter 20twenty one of Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter twenty one. The Sangrail Continued. Sir Bohort. When Sir Bohort departed from Camelot, he met with a religious man, riding upon an ass, and Sir Bohort saluted him. What are ye? said the good man. Sir, said Sir Brohort, I am a knight that fain would be counselled in the quest of the Sangrail. So rode they both together till they came to a hermitage, and there he prayed Sir Brohort to dwell that night with him. So he alighted and put away his armour, and prayed him that he might be confessed. And they went both into the chapel, and there he was clean confessed. And they ate bread and drank water together. Now, said the good man, I pray thee that thou eat none other till thou sit at the table where the Sangrail shall be. Sir, said Sir Bohort, but how know ye that I shall sit there? Yea, said the good man, that I know well, but there shall be few of your fellows with you. Then, said Sir Bohort, I agree me there too. And the good man, when he had heard his confession, found him in so pure a life and so stable that he marvelled thereof. On the morrow, as soon as the day appeared, Sir Bohort departed thence, and rode into a forest unto the hour of midday. And there befell him a marvellous adventure. For he met, at the parting of two ways, two knights that led Sir Lionel, his brother, all naked, bound upon a strong hackney, and his hands bound before his breast, and each of them held in his hand thorns wherewith they were beating him, so that he was all bloody before and behind. But he never said a word. But, as he was great of heart, he suffered all that they did to him, as though he had felt none anguish. Sir Bohort prepared to rescue his brother. But he looked on the other side of him, and saw a knight dragging along a fair gentlewoman, who cried out, St. Mary, succour your maid. And when she saw Sir Bohort, she called to him, and said, By the faith that ye owe to knighthood, help me. When Sir Bohort heard her say thus, he had such sorrow that he wist not what to do. For if I let my brother he must be slain, and that would not I for all the earth, and if I help not the maid I am shamed for ever. Then lift he up his eyes, and said, weeping, Fair lord, whose liegeman I am, keep Sir Lionel, my brother, that none of these knights slay him, and for pity of you and our lady's sake, I shall succour this maid. Then he cried out to the knight, Sir knight, lay your hand off that maid, or else she be but dead. Then the knight set down the maid, and took his shield, and drew out his sword. And Sir Bohort smote him so hard, that it went through his shield and halberdion on the left shoulder, and he fell down to the earth. Then came Sir Bohort to the maid. Ye be delivered of this knight this time. Now, she said, I pray you lead me there where this knight took me. I shall gladly do it, said Sir Bohort. So he took the horse of the wounded knight, and set the gentlewoman upon it, 
and brought her there where she desired to be. And there he found twelve knights seeking after her, and when she told him how Sir Bohort had delivered her, they made great joy, and besought him to come to her father, a great lord, and he should be right welcomed. Truly, said Sir Bohort, that may not be, for I have a great adventure to do. So he commended them to God, and departed. Then Sir Bohort rode after Sir Lionel, his brother, by the trace of their horses. Thus he rode, seeking a great while. Then he overtook a man clothed in religious clothing, who said, Sir Knight, what seek ye? Sir, said Sir Bohort, I seek my brother, that I saw within a little space beaten of two knights. Ah, Sir Bohort, trouble not thyself to seek for him, for truly he is dead. Then he showed him a new-slain body, lying in a thick bush, and it seemed to him that it was the body of Sir Lionel. And then he made such sorrow that he fell to the ground in a swoon, and lay there long. And when he came to himself again, he said, Fair brother, since the fellowship of you and me is sundered, shall I never have joy again? And now he that I have taken for my master, he be my help. And when he had said thus, he took up the body in his arms, and put it upon the horse. And then he said to the man, Canst thou tell me the way to some chapel, where I may bury this body? Come on, said the man, here is one fast by. And so they rode till they saw a fair tower, and beside it a chapel. Then they alighted both, and put the body into a tomb of marble. Then Sir Bohort commended the good man unto God, and departed. And he rode all that day, and harboured with an old lady. And on the morrow he rode into the castle in a valley, and there he met with a yeoman. Tell me, said Sir Bohort, knowest thou of any adventure? Sir, said he, here shall be under this castle a great and marvellous tournament. Then Sir Bohort thought to be there, if he might meet with any of the fellowship that were in quest of the Sangreal. So he turned to a hermitage that was on the border of the forest. And when he was come thither, he found there Sir Lionel his brother, who sat all armed at the entry of the chapel door. And when Sir Bohort saw him, he had great joy, and he alighted off his horse, and said, Fair brother, when came ye hither? As soon as Sir Lionel saw him, he said, Ah, Sir Bohort, make ye no false show, for, as for you, I might have been slain, for ye left me in peril of death to go succour a gentlewoman, and for that misdeed I now assure you but death, for ye have right well deserved it. When Sir Bohort perceived his brother's wrath, he kneeled down to the earth and cried him mercy, holding up both his hands, and prayed him to forgive him. Nay, said Sir Lionel, thou shalt have but death for it, if I have the upper hand. Therefore leap upon thy horse and keep thyself, and if thou do not, I will run upon thee there as thou standest on foot, and so the shame shall be mine, and the harm thine, but of that I reck not. When Sir Bohort saw that he must fight with his brother, or else die, he wist not what to do. Then his heart counselled him, not so to do, inasmuch as Sir Lionel was his elder brother, wherefore he ought to bear him reverence. Yet kneeled he down before Sir Lionel's horse's feet, and said, Fair brother, have mercy upon me, and slay me not. But Sir Lionel cared not, for the fiend had brought him in such a will that he should slay him. When he saw that Sir Bohort would not rise to give him battle, he rushed over him, so that he smote him with his horse's feet to the earth, and hurt him sore, that he swooned of distress. When Sir Lionel saw this, he alighted from his horse, for to have smitten off his head, and so he took him by the helm, and would have rent it from his head. But it happened that Sir Colgrevance, a knight of the round table, came at that time thither, as it was our Lord's will, and then he beheld how Sir Lionel would have slain his brother, and he knew Sir Bohort, whom he loved right well. Then he leapt down from his horse, and took Sir Lionel by the shoulders, and drew him strongly back from Sir Bohort, and said, Sir Lionel, will you slay your brother? Why, said Sir Lionel, will you stay me? If ye interfere in this, I will slay you, and him after. Then he ran upon Sir Bohort, and would have smitten him. But Sir Colgrevance ran between them, and said, If ye persist to do so any more, we two shall meddle together. Then Sir Lionel defied him, and gave him a great stroke through the helm. Then he drew his sword, for he was a passing good knight, and defended himself right manfully. So long endured the battle, that Sir Bohort rose up all anguishly, and beheld Sir Colgrevance, the good knight, fighting with his brother for his quarrel. Then was he full sorry and heavy, and thought that if Sir Colgrevance slew him, that was his brother, he should never have joy, and if his brother slew Sir Colgrevance, the shame should ever be his. Then would he have risen, for to have parted them, but he had not so much strength to stand on his feet, 
so he stayed so long that Sir Colgrevance had the worst, for Sir Lionel was of great chivalry and right hardy. Then cried Sir Colgrevance, Ah, Sir Bohort, why come you not to bring me out of peril of death, wherein I have put me to succour you? With that Sir Lionel smote off his helm and bore him to the earth. And when he had slain Sir Colgrevance, he ran upon his brother as a fiendly man, and gave him such a stroke that he made him stoop. And he that was full of humility prayed him, For God's sake, leave this battle, for if it befell, fair brother, that I slew you, or ye me, we should have been dead of that sin. Pray ye not me for mercy, said Sir Lionel. Then Sir Bohort, all weeping, drew his sword, and said, Now God have mercy upon me, though I defend my life against my brother. With that Sir Bohort lifted up his sword, and would have smitten his brother. Then he heard a voice that said, Flee, Sir Bohort, and touch him not. Right so alighted a cloud between them, in the likeness of a fire and a marvellous flame, so that they both fell to the earth, and lay there a great while in a swoon. And when they came to themselves, Sir Bohort saw that his brother had no harm, and he was right glad, for he dread sore that God had taken vengeance upon him. Then Sir Lionel said to his brother, Brother, forgive me, for God's sake, all that I have trespassed against you. And Sir Bohort answered, God forgive it thee, and I do. With that Sir Bohort heard a voice say, Sir Bohort, take thy way anon, right to the sea, for Sir Percival abideth thee there. So Sir Bohort departed, and rode the nearest way to the sea. And at last he came to an abbey that was nigh the sea. That night he rested him there, and in his sleep there came a voice unto him, and bade him go to the seashore. He started up, and made a sign of the cross on his forehead, and armed himself, and made ready his horse, and mounted him, and at a broken wall he rode out, and came to the seashore. And there he found a ship, covered all with white samite. And he entered into the ship, but it was anon so dark that he might see no man, and he laid him down, and slept till it was day. Then he awaked, and saw in the middle of the ship a knight all armed, save his helm. And then he knew it was Sir Percival de Gallus, and each made of other right great joy. Then said Sir Percival, We lack nothing now but the good knight Sir Galahad. Sir Lancelot resumed. It befell upon a night Sir Lancelot arrived before a castle, which was rich and fair. And there was a postern that was open toward the sea, and was open without any keeping, save two lions kept the entry, and the moon shined clear. Anon Sir Lancelot heard a voice that said, Lancelot, enter into the castle, where thou shalt see a great part of thy desire. So he went unto the gate, and saw the two lions. Then he set hands to his sword, and drew it. Then there came suddenly, as it were, a stroke upon the arm, so sore that the sword fell out of his hand, and he heard a voice that said, O man of evil faith, wherefore believest thou more in thy armour than in thy maker? Then said Sir Lancelot, Fair Lord, I thank thee of thy great mercy, that thou reprovest me of my misdeed. Now I see well that thou holdest me for thy servant. Then he made a cross on his forehead, and came to the lions, and they made semblance to do him harm. But he passed them without hurt, and entered into the castle, and he found no gate nor door, but it was open. But at the last he found a chamber whereof the door was shut, and he set his hand thereto, to have opened it, but he might not. Then he listened, and heard a voice which sung so sweetly, that it seemed none earthly thing. And the voice said, Joy and honour be to the Father of heaven. Then Sir Lancelot kneeled down before the chamber, for well he wist that there was the Sangrail in that chamber. Then he said, Fair, sweet Lord, if I ever did anything that pleased thee, for thy pity show me something of that which I seek. And with that he saw the chamber door open, and there came out a great clearness, that the house was as bright as though all the torches of the world had been there. So he came to the chamber door, and would have entered, and anon a voice said unto him, Stay, Sir Lancelot, and enter not. And he withdrew him back, and was right heavy in his mind. Then he looked in the midst of the chamber, and saw a table of silver, and the holy vessel, covered with red samite, and many angels about it, whereof one held a candle of wax burning, and another held a cross, and the ornaments of the altar. O oh, yet methought I saw the holy grail, all palled in crimson samite, and around great angels, awful shapes, and wings, and eyes. The Holy Grail. Then for very wonder and thankfulness Sir Lancelot forgot himself, and he stepped forward and entered the chamber. And suddenly a breath that seemed intermixed with fire smote him so sore in the visage, that therewith he fell to the ground, and had no power to rise. 
Then he felt many hands about him, which took him up, and bare him out of the chamber, without any amending of his swoon, and left him there, seeming dead to all the people. So on the morrow, when it was fair daylight, and they within were arisen, they found Sir Lancelot lying before the chamber door. And they looked upon him, and felt his pulse, to know if there were any life in him. And they found life in him, but he might neither stand nor stir any member that he had. So they took him, and bare him into a chamber, and laid him upon a bed, far from all folk, and there he lay many days. Then the one said he was alive, and the other said nay. But, said an old man, he is as full of life as the mightiest of you all, and therefore I counsel you that he be well kept till God bring him back again. After twenty-four days he opened his eyes, and when he saw folk he made a great sorrow, and said, Why have you wakened me? For I was better at ease than I am now. "'What have you seen?' said they about him. "'I have seen,' said he, "'great marvels that no tongue can tell, "'and more than any heart can think.' "'Then they said, "'Sir, the quest of the Sangrail is achieved right now in you, "'and never shall ye see more of it than ye have seen. "'I thank God,' said Sir Lancelot, "'of his great mercy, for that I have seen, for it sufficeth me.' "'Then he rose up and clothed himself, "'and when he was so arrayed they marvelled all, "'for they knew it was Sir Lancelot the good knight.' and after four days he took his leave of the lord of the castle, and of all the fellowship that were there, and thanked them for their great labour and care of him. Then he departed and turned to Camelot, where he found King Arthur and Queen Guinevere, but many of the knights of the round table were slain and destroyed, more than half. Then all the court was passing glad of Sir Lancelot, and he told the king all his adventures that had befallen him since he departed. Sir Galahad now, when Sir Galahad had rescued Percival from the twenty knights, he rode into a vast forest, wherein he abode many days. Then he took his way to the sea, and it befell him that he was benighted in a hermitage. And the good man was glad when he saw he was a knight-errant. And when they were at rest, there came a gentlewoman knocking at the door, and the good man came to the door to wit what she would. Then she said, I would speak with the knight which is with you. Then Galahad went to her, and asked her what she would. "'Sir Galahad,' said she, "'I will that ye arm you, and mount upon your horse, and follow me, for I will show you the highest adventure that ever knight saw.' Then Galahad armed himself, and commended himself to God, and bade the damsel go before, and he would follow where she led. So she rode as fast as her palfrey might bear her, till she came to the sea, and there they found the ship where Sir Bohort and Sir Percival were, who cried from the ship, "'Sir Galahad!' you are welcome, we have waited you long. And when he heard them, he asked the damsel who were there. Sir, said she, leave your horse here, and I shall leave mine, and we will join ourselves to their company. So they entered into the ship, and the two knights received them both with great joy. For they knew the damsel, that she was Sir Percival's sister. Then the wind arose, and drove them through the, then the, wind arose, and drove them through the sea all that day and the next, till the ship arrived between two rocks, passing great and marvellous. But there they might not land, for there was a whirlpool, but there was another ship, and upon it they might go without danger. "'Go we thither,' said the gentlewoman, "'and there we shall see adventures, for such is our Lord's will.' Then Sir Galahad blessed him, and entered therein, and then next the gentlewoman, and then Sir Bohort and Sir Percival. And when they came on board they found there the table of silver, and the sangrail, which was covered with red samite.' and they made great reverence thereto, and Sir Galahad prayed a long time to our Lord, that at what time he should ask to pass out of this world he should do so, and a voice said to him, Galahad, thou shalt have thy request, and when thou askest the death of thy body, thou shalt have it, and then shalt thou find the life of thy soul. And anon the wind drove them across the sea, till they came to the city of Saras. Then they took out of the ship the table of silver, and Sir Percival and Sir Bohort took it before, and Sir Galahad came behind, and right so they went to the city. And at the gate of the city they saw an old man, a cripple. And Sir Launfal said, I beheld in thee an image of him who died on the tree. Thou also hast had thy crown of thorns. Thou also hast had the world's buffets and scorns. And to thy life were not denied the wounds in thy hands and feet and side. Mild Mary's son, acknowledge me, Behold, through him I give to thee. Lowell's Holy Grail Then Galahad called him, and bade him help to bear this heavy thing. 
Truly, said the old man, it is ten years since I could not go but with crutches. Care thou not, said Sir Galahad, but arise up and show thy good will. Then the old man rose up, and assayed, and found himself as whole as ever he was, and he ran to the table, and took one part with Sir Galahad. When they came to the city it chanced that the king was just dead, and all the city was dismayed, and wist not who might be their king. Right so, as they were in council, there came a voice among them, and bade them choose the youngest knight of those three to be their king. So they made Sir Galahad king, by all the assent of the city. And when he was made king, he commanded to make a chest of gold and of precious stones to hold the holy vessel. And every day the three companions would come before it and make their prayers. Now at the year's end, and the same day of the year that Sir Galahad received the crown, he got up early, and with his fellows, came to where the holy vessel was, and they saw one kneeling before it, that had about him a great fellowship of angels. And he called Sir Galahad, and said, Come, thou servant of the Lord, and thou shalt see what thou hast much desired to see. And Sir Galahad's mortal flesh trembled right hard when he began to behold the spiritual things. Then said the good man, Now wottest thou who I am? Nay, said Sir Galahad, I am Joseph of Arimathea, whom our Lord hath sent here to thee, to bear thee fellowship. Then Sir Galahad held up his hands toward heaven, and said, Now, blessed Lord, would I not longer live, if it might please thee. And when he had said these words, Sir Galahad went to Sir Percival and to Sir Bohort, and kissed them, and commended them to God. And then he kneeled down before the table, and made his prayers, and suddenly his soul departed, and a great multitude of angels bare his soul up to heaven, so as the two fellows could well behold it. Also they saw come from heaven a hand, but they saw not the body, and the hand came right to the vessel, and bare it up to heaven. Since then there never was any one so hardy as to say that he had seen the Sangreal on earth any more. End of chapter 21「22」from Bullfinch's The Age of Chivalry。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lara Christ. The Age of Chivalry by Thomas Bullfinch. Chapter 22. Sir Agravaine's Treason. When Sir Percival and Sir Bohort saw Sir Galahad dead, they made as much sorrow as ever did two men, and if they had not been good men they might have fallen into despair. As soon as Sir Galahad was buried, Sir Percival retired to a hermitage out of the city, and took a religious clothing, and Sir Bohort was always with him, but did not change his secular clothing, because he proposed to return to the realm of Logria. Thus a year and two months lived Sir Percival in the hermitage a full holy life, and then passed out of this world, and Sir Bohort buried him by his sister and Sir Galahad. Then Sir Bohort armed himself and departed from Saras, and entered into a ship, and sailed to the kingdom of Logria and in due time arrived safe at Camelot, where the king was. Then was there great joy made of him in the whole court, for they feared he had been dead. Then the king made great clerks to come before him, that they should chronicle of the high adventures of the good knights, and Sir Bohort told him of the adventures that had befallen him, and his two fellows, Sir Percival and Sir Galahad. And Sir Lancelot told the adventures of the Song Royale that he had seen. All this was made in great books, and put up in the church at Salisbury. So King Arthur and Queen Guinevere made great joy of the remnant that were come home, and chiefly of Sir Lancelot and Sir Bohort. Then Sir Lancelot began to resort unto Queen Guinevere again, and forgot the promise that he made in the quest, so that many in the court spoke of it, and in especial Sir Agravaine, Sir Gawain's brother, for he was ever open-mouthed. So it happened Sir Gawain and all his brothers were in King Arthur's chamber, and then Sir Agravaine said thus openly, I marvel that we all are not ashamed to see and to know so noble a knight as King Arthur, so to be shamed by the conduct of Sir Lancelot and the Queen. Then spoke Sir Gawain, and said, Brother, Sir Agravaine, I pray you and charge you, move not such matters any more before me, for be ye assured I will not be of your counsel. Neither will we, said Sir Gaheris and Sir Gareth. Then will I, said Sir Modred. I doubt you not, said Sir Gawain, for to all mischief ever were ye prone, yet I would that ye left all this, for I know what will come of it. Modred's narrow foxy face, heart-hiding smile, and grey persistent eye, henceforward too, the powers that tend the soul to help it from the death that cannot die, and save it even in extremes, began to vex and plague. Guinevere. Fall of it would fall may, said Sir Agravaine. I will disclose it to the king. With that came to them King Arthur. Now, brothers, hold your peace, said Sir Gawain. We will not, said Sir Agravaine. 
Then said Sir Gawain, I will not hear your tales, nor be of your counsel. No more will I, said Sir Gareth and Sir Gaheris, and therewith they departed, making great sorrow. Then Sir Agravaine told the king all that was said in the court of the conduct of Sir Lancelot and the queen, and it grieved the king very much, but he would not believe it to be true without proof. So Sir Agravaine laid a plot to entrap Sir Lancelot and the queen, intending to take them together unawares. Sir Agravaine and Sir Modred led a party for this purpose, but Sir Lancelot escaped from them, having slain Sir Agravaine and wounded Sir Modred. Then Sir Lancelot hastened to his friends, and told them what had happened, and withdrew with them to the forest, but he left spies to bring him tidings of whatever might be done. So Sir Lancelot escaped, but the queen remained in the king's power, and Arthur could no longer doubt of her guilt, and the law was such in those days that they who committed such crimes, of what estate or condition soever they were, must be burned to death, and so it was ordained for Queen Guinevere. Then said King Arthur to Sir Gawain, I pray you, make you ready in your best armour with your brethren, Sir Gaheris and Sir Gareth, to bring my queen to the fire, there to receive her death. Nay, my most noble lord, said Sir Gawain, that will I never do, for know thou well, my heart will never serve me to see her die, and it shall never be said that I was of your counsel in her death. Then the king commanded Sir Gaheris and Sir Gareth to be there, and they said, We will be there, as ye command us, sire, but in peaceable wise, and bear no armour upon us. So the queen was led forth, and her ghostly father was brought to her to shrive her, and there was weeping and wailing of many lords and ladies. And one went and told Sir Lancelot that the queen was led forth to her death. Then Sir Lancelot and the knights that were with him fell upon the troop that guarded the queen, and dispersed them, and slew all who withstood them. And in the confusion Sir Gareth and Sir Gaheris were slain, for they were unarmed and defenceless. And Sir Lancelot carried away the queen to his castle of La Joyeuse Garde. Then there came one to Sir Gawain, and told him how that Sir Lancelot had slain the knights, and carried away the queen. "'O oh Lord, defend my brethren!' said Sir Gawain. "'Truly,' said the man, "'Sir Gareth and Sir Gaheris are slain.' "'Alas!' said Sir Gawain, "'now is my joy gone!' And then he fell down and swooned, and long he lay there, as he had been dead. When he arose out of his swoon, Sir Gawain ran to the king, crying, "'O King Arthur, mine uncle, my brothers are slain!' Then the king wept, and he both. "'My king, my lord, and mine uncle,' said Sir Gawain, "'bear witness now that I make you a promise that I shall hold by my knighthood, and from this day I will never fail Sir Lancelot until the one of us has slain the other. I will seek Sir Lancelot through seven kings' realms, but I shall slay him, or he shall slay me.' "'You shall not need to seek him,' said the king, "'for as I hear, Sir Lancelot will abide me and you in the joyous guard. And much people draweth unto him, as I hear say.' That may I believe, said Sir Gawain, but my lord, summon your friends, and I will summon mine. It shall be done, said the king. So then the king sent letters of, and writs throughout all England, and both in the length and breadth, to summon all his knights. And unto Arthur drew many knights and dukes and earls, so that he had a great host. Thereof heard Sir Lancelot, and collected all whom he could, and many good knights held with him, both for his sake and for the queen's sake. But King Arthur's host was too great for Sir Lancelot to abide him in the field, and he was full loath to do battle against the king. So Sir Lancelot drew him to his strong castle with all manner of provisions. Then came King Arthur with Sir Gawain, and laid siege all about La Joyeuse Guard, both the town and the castle. But in no wise would Sir Lancelot ride out of his castle, neither suffer any of his knights to issue out, until many weeks were passed. Then it befell upon a day in harvest time, Sir Lancelot looked over the wall, and spoke aloud to King Arthur and Sir Gawain, My lords both, all is in vain that ye do at this siege, for here ye shall win no worship, but only dishonour. For if I list to come out, and my good knights, I shall soon make an end of this war. Come forth, said Arthur, if thou darest, and I promise thee, I shall meet thee in the midst of the field. God forbid me, said Sir Lancelot, that I should encounter with the most noble king that made me knight. "'Fie upon thy fair language,' said the king, "'for thou know well I am thy mortal foe, "'and ever will be to my dying day.' "'And Sir Gawain said, "'What cause hadst thou to slay my brother, "'Sir Gaheris, who bore no arms against thee, "'and Sir Gareth, whom thou madest knight, "'and who loved thee more than all my kin? "'Therefore know thou well I shall make war to thee "'all the while that I may live.' "'When Sir Bohort and Sir Hector de Maris "'and Sir Lionel heard this outcry, "'they called to them Sir Palamedes,' and Sir Sapphire, his brother, and Sir Lawain, with many more, and all went to Sir Lancelot.
And they said, My lord, Sir Lancelot, we pray you, if you will have our service, keep us no longer within these walls, for know well all your fair speech and forbearance will not avail you. Alas, said Sir Lancelot, to ride forth and to do battle I am full loath. Then he spake again unto the king and Sir Gawain, and willed them to keep out of the battle, but they despised his words. So then Sir Lancelot's fellowship came out of the castle, in full good array. And always Sir Lancelot charged all his knights, in any wise, to save King Arthur and Sir Gawain. Then came forth Sir Gawain from the king's host, and offered combat. And Sir Lionel encountered with him, and there Sir Gawain smote Sir Lionel through the body, that he fell to the earth as if dead. Then there began a great conflict, and much people were slain. But ever Sir Lancelot did what he might to save the people on King Arthur's party, and ever King Arthur followed Sir Lancelot to slay him. But Sir Lancelot suffered him, and would not strike again. Then Sir Bohort encountered with King Arthur, and smote him down, and he alighted and drew his sword, and said to Sir Lancelot, Shall I make an end of this war? For he meant to have slain King Arthur. Not so, said Sir Lancelot, touch him no more, for I will never see that most noble king made me knight, either slain or shamed. And therewith Sir Lancelot alighted off his horse, and took up the king, and horsed him again, and said thus, My lord Arthur, for God's love, cease this strife. And King Arthur looked upon Sir Lancelot, and the tears burst from his eyes, thinking on the great courtesy that was in Sir Lancelot more than in any other man. And therewith the king rode his way. And then anon both parties withdrew to repose them, and buried the dead. But the war continued, and it was noised abroad through all Christendom, and at last it was told afore the Pope, and he, considering the great goodness of King Arthur and of Sir Lancelot, called unto him a noble clerk, which was the Bishop of Rochester, who was then in his dominions, and sent them to King Arthur, charging him that he take his queen, Dame Guinevere, unto him again, and make peace with Sir Lancelot. So, by means of this bishop, peace was made for the space of one year, and King Arthur received back the queen, and Sir Lancelot departed from the kingdom with all his knights, and went to his own country. So they shipped at Cardiff, and sailed unto Benwick, which some men called Bayonne. And all the people of those lands came to Sir Lancelot, and received him home right joyfully. And Sir Lancelot established and garnished all his towns and castles, and he greatly advanced all his noble knights, and Sir Lionel, and Sir Bohort, and Sir Hector de Maris, Sir Blamor, Sir Lawain, and many others, and made them lords of lands and castles, till he left himself no more than any one of them. Then Arthur made vast banquets, and strange knights from the four winds came in, and each one sat, though served with choice from air, land, stream, and sea, oft in mid-banquet, measuring with his eyes his neighbor's make and might. Peleus in Atar. But when the year was past, King Arthur and Sir Gawain came with a great host, and landed upon Sir Lancelot's lands, and burned and wasted all that they might overrun. Then spake Sir Bohort, and said, My lord, Sir Lancelot, give us leave to meet them in the field, and we shall make them rue the time that ever they came to this country. Then said Sir Lancelot, I am full loath to ride out with my knights for shedding of Christian blood, so we will yet a while keep our walls, and I will send a messenger unto my lord Arthur, to propose a treaty, for better is peace than always war. So Sir Lancelot sent forth a damsel and a dwarf with her, requiring King Arthur to leave his warring upon his lands, and so she started on a palfrey, and the dwarf ran by her side. And when she came to the pavilion of King Arthur, she alighted, and there met her a gentle knight, Sir Lucan, the butler, and said, Fair damsel, come ye from Sir Lancelot de Locke? Yea, sir, she said, I come hither to speak with the king. Alas, said Sir Lucan, my lord Arthur would be reconciled to Sir Lancelot, but Sir Gawain will not suffer him. And with this Sir Lucan led the damsel to the king, where he sat with Sir Gawain to hear what she would say. So when she had told her tale, the tears ran out of the king's eyes, and all the lords were forward to advise the king to be accorded with Sir Lancelot, save only Sir Gawain. And he said, My lord, mine uncle, what will ye do? Will ye now turn back, now you are so far advanced upon your journey? If ye do, all the world will speak shame of you. Nay, said King Arthur, I will do as ye advise me. But do thou give the damsel her answer, for I may not speak to her for pity. Then said Sir Gawain, Damsel, say ye to Sir Lancelot, that it is waste labor to sue to mine uncle for peace, and say that I, Sir Gawain, send him word that I promise him, by the faith I owe unto God and to knighthood, I shall never leave him, till he have slain me, or I him. So the damsel returned, and when Sir Lancelot had heard this answer, the tears ran down his cheeks. Then it befell on a day Sir Gawain came before the gates, armed at all points, and cried with a loud voice, Where art thou now, thou false traitor, Sir Lancelot? Why hidest thou thyself within holes and walls like a coward? Look out now, thy traitor knight, and I will avenge upon thy body the death of my three brethren. 
All this language heard Sir Lancelot, and the knights which were about him, and they said to him, Sir Lancelot, now must ye defend you like a knight, or else be shamed for ever, for you have slept over long, and suffered over much. Then Sir Lancelot spake on high unto King Arthur, and said, My lord Arthur, now I have forborne long, and suffered you and Sir Gawain to do what ye would, and now must I needs defend myself, inasmuch as Sir Gawain hath appealed me of treason. Then Sir Lancelot armed him, and mounted upon his horse, and the noble knights came out of the city, and the host without stood all apart, and so the covenant was made that no man should come near the two knights, nor deal with them, till one were dead or yielded. Then Sir Lancelot and Sir Gawain departed a great way asunder, and then they came together with all their horses' might, and each smote the other in the middle of their shields, but neither of them was unhorsed, but their horses fell to the earth. And then they leapt from their horses, and drew their swords, and gave many sad strokes, so that the blood burst out in many places. Now Sir Gawain had this gift from a holy man, that every day in the year, from morning to noon, his strength was increased threefold, and then it fell again to its natural measure. Sir Lancelot was aware of this, and therefore during the three hours that Sir Gawain's strength was at the height, Sir Lancelot covered himself with his shield, and kept his might in reserve. And during that time Sir Gawain gave him many sad brunts, that all the knights that looked on marveled how Sir Lancelot might endure them. Then when it was past noon, Sir Gawain had only his own might, and when Sir Lancelot felt him so brought down, he stretched himself up, and doubled his strokes, and gave Sir Gawain such a buffet that he fell down on his side, and Sir Lancelot drew back, and would strike no more. "'Why withdrawest thou, false traitor?' Then said Sir Gawain, "'Now turn again and slay me, for if thou leave me thus when I am whole again, I shall do battle with thee again.' "'I shall endure you, sir, by God's grace,' said Sir Lancelot. "'But know thou well, Sir Gawain, I will never smite a felled knight.' And so Sir Lancelot went into the city, and Sir Gawain was born unto King Arthur's pavilion, and his wounds were looked to. Thus the siege endured, and Sir Gawain lay helpless near a month, and when he was near recovered came tidings unto King Arthur that made him return with all his hosts to England. End of chapter 22